How's it going everyone? Welcome back to the channel. My name is Jinluka. I'm a second year Canadian medical student and in the month of August on the channel we are going over all the tips that I have trying to help college and university students that are getting ready to go back to school hopefully have the best year academically anyways that you've ever had. So I'm actually really excited to be doing today's video even though it's probably going to get a little bit controversial in there somewhere, but what we're going to be talking about today is what I want to call the hidden curriculum. These are the little tips and tricks that no one's going to tell you. You're not going to find on any course syllabus, but I was in my undergrad for five years, and these are the tips and tricks that you pick up the longer you're in a program that are going to make your life at school so much easier, and we're going over all of them right now. Now before we get started, if I could just go ahead and ask you guys to flatline that like button down below, turn it blue, it helps the channel so so much, and then let's get to it. Oh, no. So let's start off by stating the obvious. The most important things when it comes to getting a 4.0 GPA overall or acing that final exam are going to be doing your work, being dedicated, and staying consistent with your studies. Now having said that, at a certain point as a student, it becomes in your best interest to work smarter in addition to also working harder. And that's going to be the most important thing, working smart and hard together, putting in that time, but then also knowing the best way to go about things. And that's where these tips are really going to help out. The ins and outs of being a student and staying successful. So tip number one, how to handle grizzly bear courses. Now grizzly bear courses are the courses that are notorious in your program as the GPA and dream killers. Now back when I was an undergrad in my biomedical science program, one of the big grizzly bear courses that we had was our statistics course. But these could also be courses like organic chemistry, biochemistry, things that are notoriously difficult for pre-meds and end up in a lot of people either doing very poorly or failing outright. Now for those of you guys that have been watching these videos for long enough, you've known that I've been calling these courses grizzly bear courses for a very long time. And the reason why is it all boils back to the method in which you would fight a grizzly bear. And that's that you don't fight grizzly bears, ever. What I would recommend instead is that when you're faced with one of these courses, drop it from your schedule almost immediately and replace it with either an elective or something else that you're supposed to be taking next year if you could fit it into your timetable now. And what you're going to be doing with that course is move it to the summertime. Take it in either the spring session or the summer session and that way you could focus on that one course for the entire time, give it the attention that it needs and it's not going to be nearly as stressful as dealing with this really difficult course amidst four to five other courses. Another thing that you'll see when taking a grizzly bear course in the summertime instead of the fall or winter semesters is that a lot of the students there with you will already have failed that course in the fall or winter semesters. And for that reason, when the schools open up these additional classes in the summertime, they'll try their best to add some additional resources and help people out so that they don't fail the course again. And that's something that you could really take advantage of when going through that course. Now, if for whatever reason you can't move that grizzly bear course into the summertime, then just make sure that you're going into that course in the regular semester, prepared to fight the grizzly bear. Now tip number two off the hidden curriculum is going to be all about test banks and answer keys. Now this is going to be a topic that's filled with controversy but basically what happens is that for some courses, specifically a lot of the electives, not really a lot of the core courses, but the professors will sometimes use a test bank that's linked to a course textbook and that way instead of making their own test questions, what they'll do is just go through this test bank, pick a few of the questions recommended by the author of the original textbook and use those on a multiple choice test instead of making their own questions. So to simplify that a little bit, you could actually buy books that your professors are using to make the questions for your test. I don't think it gets much more hidden than that. Now, I'm not talking about some sketchy document that's been passed down from a friend of a friend who took this course four years ago. What I'm referring to specifically are actually published books that you could buy on Amazon or directly from the websites that are going to have questions that the author recommends that professors give based off of the required text. Now, my argument for buying test banks, or rather buying officially licensed books that are specifically designed to enhance the required readings, is that they're great. Because really, there's only two possibilities here. On the one hand, your professors could actually go ahead and take direct questions from this book and use it on your actual test, and then you're golden. And I, and I get that sometimes professors are busy, they need to cut corners, and they borrow questions from other places. But on the other hand, even if they don't, you are going to be using those questions that were recommended by the author to study the material that you were supposed to be reading. So either the questions show up and you've already studied them and you know the answers, or you're actually just reviewing your own knowledge and figuring out how to answer the specific questions and there 
therefore are preparing to write the final exam. Now, I will say though, just make sure that you're looking into your own school's specific policies regarding academic misconduct and how that works in terms of using officially licensed test banks. Now that we're here though, tip number three is that you don't need to buy every single textbook for every class that you take, or even the majority of them when it comes to most programs out there. I remember back in first year, first semester, they actually sold us a box of like eight different books that were required for the first year science students. But in reality, it turns out that we only needed about two or three of them. Now, I remember that that box actually cost me like five or six hundred dollars at the time. And for those of you that might be thinking that that's not really a big deal in terms of textbooks, I just go ahead and ask you to reconsider for those of us that are paying for our entire education by ourselves. Spending less money on textbooks means taking less shifts at work in order to pay for the textbooks and hopefully translates to more time that you're actually able to study. The problem though is that sometimes the textbooks really were useful for the lecture and trying to figure out when a required textbook was necessary and when it was optional could be pretty difficult sometimes. So my plan was always to just talk to the professor after class, explain the situation and ask them their opinion on whether or not this textbook would be mandatory or recommended by them. My rule was that if a professor told me they would be testing on material that was exclusively covered in a textbook, then I'd go ahead and buy the textbook. But if not, I'd try and save my money for other resources. And on that note, buying online PDFs or buying the textbooks directly from the publisher or on Amazon instead of the campus store could save you a ton of money. My fourth tip off the hidden curriculum is going to be super simple, but also very, very important and something that I didn't learn until much later on in my undergrad. It's that when course registration opens and you're able to sign up for a few different courses, you're trying to fill your timetable, sign up from more courses than you could fit and then drop the ones that you don't like before the drop date and pick the ones that you really do like. Basically, the way this works is let's say I was able to fit five courses into my semester to be considered full-time. What I do instead is fill my semester with seven or eight courses upon course registration and then what I do is for the entire first week of class, I'd go to every single one of my classes and get a feel for what they'd be like. Then what I do is pick my top five favorite courses and I would drop the remaining courses and this decision was based off of how interesting the course seemed to me, and then also what the mark breakdown looked like. If you do course selection this way, you'll never have to worry about not being able to fill your entire five course requirement to be a full-time student, and you'll make sure that out of all of your available choices, you ended up with the ones that you chose that are like the best. And finally guys, my last tip, and this is probably something that I get asked about almost as much as anything else regarding back to school, is about a little website called RateMyProfessors.com. Now RateMyProfessors.com is actually a forum, for lack of a better explanation, where students who have taken classes before from certain teachers could go on and write reviews about the professors that they've had for their classes. Now what you'll see if you decide to use this website is that you could actually search for either a professor or your school. And if you search for a school it'll give you like a drop down menu of all of the different professors that you could select from. Once you click on a professor it will take you to their created profile which has been created for them by their students assumably. And what happens then is that the students will list their overall review of the professor, what they got in their class, the professor's level of difficulty, and then finally the quality or what the student thought the quality of the professor was. Now first, the problem with this website. One of the reasons why I do not like RateMyProfessors.com is because there's something known as a selection bias. One of the things that you'll see when you're giving reviews for people online or not in person, especially behind a computer screen, is that a lot of the people that take the time out of their day to go in and leave a review will have done so because they have negative feelings towards the person. There are going to be less people that take the time out of the day to go in and leave a positive review versus someone that has some sort of animosity towards this professor. And in that way, sometimes the reviews that you're finding on the website are going to be negatively skewed towards the professor. Just to offer a personal insight, one time I showed up to one of my electives and beforehand I had checked out the professor on RateMyProfessor.com and I saw that they had like a one out of five so it really was a very low score. But then after being in the course for about two weeks, I realized that this was just a really awesome person and it was one of my favorite professors in all of my time that I'd spent in university. The second problem with this website is that I know a lot of professors that actually have a lot of anxiety regarding things like, like RateMyProf.com. There's also doctors that I know because there's an equivalent site called RateMyMDs.com and poor scores on these websites often make people feel just terrible. So the one disclaimer that I want to go ahead and leave here is that you are totally free to write negative reviews about anyone you want, YouTubers, professors, doctors. I would just suggest that you be very careful and at least diplomatic in the actual words that you're using to describe certain people and try and give them the benefit of the doubt if possible. Now having said that however, I do know people that have made their entire semester breakdown based off of their professor's scores on RateMyProf and they've told me that it's been very successful for them. My advice 
advice regarding this website in general is that if you're going to use it, try not to pay too much attention to the overall rating of the professor, but rather read the reviews, try and find if there's any helpful tips regarding the courses that that, that professor taught. For example, certain textbooks that might be useful or not be useful, and the best time to show up for office hours. And with that, that is it. Those are my five hidden curriculum tips, the things that you guys need to know. Normally you would pick up the longer you've been in university, but let's go ahead and skip that step, give it to you guys right now, and hopefully you could use these to do amazing this year in university or college. Quick info about me for today, um, it is going to be a super busy day. I have so much homework to do, uh, so I'm going to get this video edited quick, put it up on YouTube, get back to studying as soon as possible. Uh, we got another one coming out next week, my final video on back to school tips, trying to get everyone ready. So if you want to see that one, feel free to subscribe to this channel. We'll see you guys all in the next one. Everyone take it easy.